Sonic, the heart of your system. Hi and welcome back to my Render PC 2019, which seems to become Render PC 2020 because I had so many delays in between with Christmas and everything. Uh, but now finally getting back uh, to this project and um, a lot of things changed in between because 30 Bar was released and a lot of people asked, hey Roman, do you regret your decision to go with the 28 core uh, Xeon while the 3970X is now out, which is a lot cheaper and therefore obviously it's becoming even more a project that's very irrational. And uh, let's just quickly take a look at some benchmarks that Steve from Gamers Nexus performed. If we compare Adobe Premiere benchmarks in 4K rendering, we see the 3970X stock takes about 6.1 minutes. Um, with a little bit of OC, we can get it down to 5.9 minutes. The 3175X, the 28 core Xeon is at 5.7 minutes and with a little bit of OC 5.1 gigahertz, the 3175X28 Core Xeon comes down to 5.1 minutes. So um, just um, in this very specific application, the 28 Core Xeon is still faster than the 32 Core AMD Threadripper, the new one. Of course, it's really not a wise choice considering the price of the CPU. Comparing it to the Threadripper, Threadripper would make so much more sense because it's like half the price and uh, you get almost the same performance in Adobe Premiere so if I would give an advice I would not recommend to buy this but I'm still happy with my choice because it's such a special platform and there's something else um, why I picked this platform that was one of the main decisions or main reasons why I actually went with those motherboards and also this platform. Taking the fact aside that this is a very special CPU and the whole platform is something really unconventional, which is something I find really interesting, there was one very specific um, feature which led me to buy or choose this platform and that's U.2. I know that not many people are using U.2, but I think in this very specific application U.2 is very, very interesting. U.2 is a connection for storage very similar to M.2 or to SATA, um, but not many people are using it and that's mainly because not many drives are available at a very interesting price point. But here I have some Western Digital um, Ultrastar DC SN630 SSDs and one of those drives has 7.68 terabyte which is quite a lot and now one of this drive is 1250 euro which is not cheap but considering the capacity of this SSD it's again fairly cheap. If you will go out and check what kind of drives are available at above 4 terabyte there's not much available. Um, if you check normal SATA drives um, there is I think only one um, from Micron with a 7.68 um, terabyte but then SATA is only 500 megabyte per second or 550 megabyte per second max read write. So that's kind of not great. If you have this much storage available, you maybe want to transfer a lot of data and therefore 550 megabyte per second is not that fast. Then you can check out M.2 drives and then M.2 drives typically end at about 2 or maximum 4 terabyte. And even the 4 terabyte drives the availability at least here in Germany is really not great and the pricing is also not that great. And then if you go over to U.2, you will see that there's a lot of drives available and a lot of those drives are I mean they're pricey, they're not cheap, don't get me wrong, but you get a lot of stuff there, even like 30 terabyte or 15 terabyte at a, I would say, fairly reasonable price um, considering the capacity. So the SN630 is using U.2. U.2 is something I've seen on so many mainboards over the past years, but I've never personally used it. Over those years, I always asked myself, what is U.2 even used for? That's maybe one of the reasons why it completely disappeared, for example, for TRX40. No clue if that's the reason. Uh, I wish it would be back, otherwise I would have maybe gone for TRX40. Um, to quickly uh, sum it up, U.2 is basically M.2 over cable. This connector is called SFF8643, which is the connector that goes into the mainboard. This wider connector is called SFF8643. 39 renamed to U.2 for the consumer market. This comes from the enterprise market. If I take a look at the connector itself, it also says PCI Express 3.0 and PCI Express 4.0, which is quite, uh, quite interesting. The connector itself is pretty much the same as a uh, SAS connector, but comes with additional SATA power and has a lot more pins than the typical SAS connector because it's using the NVMe protocol, which is something SAS doesn't do. If you check out the datasheet of the SN630, you will notice that idle power consumption is already 6 watt, while load is between 9 and 11 watt. 
And that's quite a lot, but I was kind of expecting this from a very high capacity SSD. Um, it's very well known that that's kind of the limitation for uh, those SSDs nowadays because in a typical consumer system you would need a very good airflow to cool a 2.5 inch drive with something like 10 or 15 watt uh, power consumption. That's why we will start the build today with uh, the cooling of the SN630. Both of those 7.6 terabyte drives will eventually be put into RAID 1 and I will mount them onto this very simple aluminium cooler. It's just a chunk of aluminium um, has quite some mass which is very good to compensate uh, sudden spikes of the load of the SSD so if one or both of them suddenly have maximum power consum consumption which is then um, combined 20 watt this one can take up the load because it has quite some mass and you can see it has quite some surface area as well for heat dissipation um, if it goes back to idle both of them together is like 12 watt and surely this kind of surface area um, is able to dissipate like 12 or 15 watt um, of heat. Both SSDs will be mounted onto the aluminium plate like this. I went to Casking and lasered this 10 millimeter acrylic plate. You can see four holes in the center. Those holes will be used to mount the cooler itself onto this plate. And then we have additional four holes on the side and those four holes will be used to mount the acrylic plate onto the case. You can see I invested in some new tools again. I have this machine for cutting threads, um, not mainly for those very th small threads, but for having like a G uh, one fourth thread uh, inside like very thin acrylic sheets uh, for water cooling. It's very convenient to have this because um, you can have very straight holes. While if you do that from uh, by hand, you will always have some very strange and uneven holes inside acrylic for water cooling. But you can see the thread cutter is sitting into this and then it's very convenient to have a very even and straight hole. Cooling plate is ready to go. Uh, we have the holes with threads inside. I also prepared the acrylic plate, um, added some chamfer on the holes for the screws that will eventually uh, hold down the plate onto the SSDs. Now I will use some uh, thermal grizzly minus pads, 0.5 millimeter thermal pads, um, mainly 0.5 millimeter only because the thinner the better, the less uh, heat restrictive it is. Um, I will have to cut them into sizes. I also thought about um, opening them and checking how they look inside and which components are actually cooled and to what kind of uh, metal plates they are connected with but then I spent 1200 euros on them and uh, yeah if I open them warranty um, is gone and in case one of them ever dies at least I can return them if I don't open them therefore putting uh, the SSDs on to the cooler now. Both thermal pads are attached to the SSDs. Now I'm going to put them onto the cooler. Thank you. 
This is how the Inwin 928 looks like from the backside. We have two spaces for PSU mounting. We will only occupy one though, um, only the top one. In theory, you can attach two PSUs to the Dominus Extreme, which is kind of cool for extreme overclocking because you can easily get to like 1500 watt or even like 2000 watt um, spikes if you perform like very extreme benchmarks with liquid nitrogen. Uh, that's why two PSUs can make sense for extreme overclocking but for what we're going to do two PSUs are really not necessary for uh, daily usage. That's why we will only occupy the top slot with one PSU and the bottom one will not be used and uh, I will just remove this one. That's where we will put the SSD cooler. I think this position looks quite nice. Um, I only have to drill four holes quickly, cut some threads for the M3 um, spaces right here, and then we can mount this thing. The acrylic distro plate is now also fixed inside the system, added a screw down here and uh, one on the side um, should be enough to keep it in place. I mean there's not really any force uh, going on this distro plate so this should be fine. Also thanks for uh, pointing me towards this tool which was included in the delivery of the 928 case. I somehow missed this. It was, it was completely on the bottom of the uh, packaging. It is to unmount uh, those uh, big nuts. For example down here so I was able to remove the radiator shroud um, of the front and already removed the in-wind fans. The in-wind fans will be replaced by those Corsair ML140 Pro RGB fans mainly because they have a quite good performance on radiators uh, even with quite uh, low RPM. I tested this um, while building some systems at Case King and also because I like the visuals of those fans. Also in the top radiator shroud I will remove the in-wind fans, replace them with the ML140 RGB Pro uh, fans and also mount those uh, EK Coolstream uh, CE420 radiators. Uh, we will have two of them in total which should be sufficient for CPU and GPU. In general GPU should be fine with a 280 radiator uh, while the CPU will need a little bit more cooling because it can really really consume a lot of power. We're already again at the end of this video for Project Irrationality. Um, so far we made some good progress. Uh, both radiators are mounted, all the fans are now uh, mounted inside the case. Uh, distro blade is fixed to the case as well, as well as the SSD cooler that is mounted in the back of the case, so basically sitting uh, behind the mainboard. So the SSDs are ready to be attached uh, to the mainboard via uh, U.2. The only thing that's pretty much missing is the full water cooling loop. Um, the VGA is also ready. We can mount it on here with the riser card. Then we only have to attach the pump with the reservoir combination and then yeah, do the water cooling loop with the glass tubes, which will be a lot of time I think and uh, should also be some fun. The only thing I have to do is I prepared an acrylic plate on the right side to cover all the holes and to be able to mount the reservoir and pump combination on there but because the uh, Corsair fans have a different dimension than the in-wind fans I have to uh, remeasure and uh, maybe recut the acrylic plate. Uh, we'll see but I will prepare that for the next video. Thanks for tuning in and see you next time. Bye!